embracing one for your presence, God, for your for your love, God.
thirst or what are we, Father? And you just love us regardless of who we are, Lord. You love us so much, God. And so as we can continue to give you praise, not just through song, but through our witness, through our walk of daily life, Father. We ask you to bless us, Father. I know that things don't always go our way, Father. But through the dark, Lord, there's light. I know you have a plan. Sometimes we don't see it. And sometimes we don't understand it. But there's a plan. I know we pray to, to show it to us, Father, but we just have to have faith for that sight. We just have to go through this life, Lord, worshiping you, glorifying you, having faith. And whatever situation comes through, to bless us, Father. Help us and carry us through this time. Thank you, Jesus. And I just ask, Lord, if you continue to bless this night while uh, Pastor Reuben shares his message to us, God, that you've given him, Father, just continue to bless us. Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. That's our great one, started tonight. Wasn't that great worship? Yes. Wow. Amazing. He deserves it all. Yes. No. You need to realize he deserves it all. <laughs> He's given so much, so much to us. Thank you, Jesus. So, uh, Jesus virtual, virtual reality. We have about 37 signups. So, for the first Sunday, that's good. And there was a lot of people missing from church, so hopefully this next Sunday we'll get the other uh, 10 or so that we need. And then we we'll need to give them a call and make uh, a date, and we'll go from there. So keep that in prayer. Um, you might want to invite someone that you know to come out and see it. You can kind of, uh, you know, not, not lie to them, but say, hey, why don't you come out and see a virtual reality movie? Really cool. They'll put you right there on the spot. I don't know if you've ever seen one, but you're invited to come out. Come with me. I'll even drive you, pick you up, and take you to the place. And then when you drive up here, he's going to go, But he'll, they'll be committed to come. So um, we can have up to 100. So as long as you sign them up, you pay, we'll know how many exactly they'll need to bring. So, so think about inviting someone to come out. <coughs> Sorry. Let's see, also, um, it's final. We're having our men's retreat October 4th through the 6th, right. which is a Friday night through Sunday morning. We will be looking at the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. That will be the theme. We have two messages and two devotions, and we will have two afterglows. 
on Friday night and Saturday. So it is going to be a great time. The Lord is just going to bless us. His presence will be there. And he is going to impart gifts and power and strength for us to live our life before the world. The cost, get this, for the whole three nights is only $125. That's with everything included. A t-shirt, food galore, our special chef, Manny. So it's going to be a great night, so I hope that you'll make plans uh, to sign up. I believe there's going to be a deposit. Carlos will be uh, um, AIing all the guys with an invitation to join us and a link to sign up and pay your deposit, which will be non-refundable until I, uh, there's a certain date that it's, uh, it's refundable. That is the other part, not the first deposit. <clears throat> and then he's going to give you the payments in case you can't afford the whole 125 up front. So. So we're excited about that. We, we met together and prayed together on Monday, and we're believing that God is going to keep his promises and do a great work. If I can have the ushers come forward. If you don't have a bulletin, you can ask for one too, and, and they'll get you one if you want to take it home. <clears throat> so, God is going to take it all the time. You know, as we've been going through the book of Numbers, and we will be in Numbers chapter 10 tonight, I was thinking about how the Lord just really ministered to the children of Israel after bringing them out of Egypt in a great way. I mean, he he showed himself uh, very clearly in power and strength, right? Uh, Getting Pharaoh to let him go, drowning the chariots of the Egyptians that were after them, dividing the Red Sea, cloud that hovers over them and stays with them. I mean, come on. That would be a miracle in itself to see this cloud leading you and guiding you night by fire by night and cloud by day. I mean, he showed himself powerful. And then he collected from them because we're going to build a temporary tabernacle and we're going to have all these instruments that are part of it and every one of them is going to point to the Messiah. And the people gave, the people supported, the people were a part of it. And it all took place because there's a co-labor between God and us. And so the Lord uses our resources for his glory. He wants us investing in the kingdom of God. If you have a retirement plan, uh, it would be uh, really good today because I heard the market really went up in the first time in so much. Thank you, President Trump. Um, And people are making money you know, hand over fist right now because of what's going on in the economy. Well, guess what? You invest in the kingdom of God and the market's nothing compared to what God's going to give you. Amen. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for grace and mercy. We thank you for the opportunity to support your work here in this community, Lord. And Lord, give us wisdom as we uh, hand out the resources to the children's ministry, to the men's ministry, to the youth ministry, Lord, to the Calvary Cares and and other ministries that reach out to India, Lord God, and support uh, ministries that help Christians who are going through uh, struggles, Father, and, and various other ministries that we support, Lord. We pray that you would just bless those that give and that they realize that they cannot outgive you, Father, and they give back to you, Father. Bless the message, Lord, we pray. Let your Holy Spirit be our teacher. Let him illuminate his word to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, let's open up our Bibles to the book of Numbers, chapter 10. That's in the Old Testament. The first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, or the Torah. You have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. And then Deuteronomy is the last book that we'll get into. Today's message will be dealing with God moving the children of Israel out towards the Promised Land. Tonight's theme is, Blow the Trumpets. Blow the Trumpets. Now, I don't know about you, but I remember being a little kid and having a trumpet. Somebody had a trumpet. I don't know if I had a trumpet myself. I can't remember the details. But I know there was a trumpet around. 
And I love to grab that thing and just try to blow into it. You know, make a bunch of noise. And of course, you kind of uh, get your parents upset that they don't like you running around making a bunch of noise with trumpets. Now, I sure wish that we had two trumpets because it seemed that all the boys wanted to play that one trumpet. And we were always fighting for it. You know, of course, everyone's spit was in it, which isn't good. But boys are boys, and they enjoy things like that. But blowing that trumpet was just so much fun. I think it's a guy thing more than a girl thing, right? Guys just love blowing trumpets. And, and, and we love the noise that it makes, the power that it has, the attention that it grabs, and so forth. And so we're going to talk about two trumpets here that the Lord asked Moses to build. Now, the military culture of early civilization used trumpets, interest, instruments, for the purpose of war. So really, this is a guy thing. They use the trumpets to sound for battle and preparation because they were going to war. Ancient trumpet types are documented in nearly every culture, including those of ancient Egyptian, Assyrians, the Israelites, the Greeks, the Romans, uh, the Celtics, as well as the Asian cultures. They all had trumpets at that time whether to gather each other together for preparation and then to begin battle. And these instruments were also used for religious ceremonies, functions as military signaling devices. They were also used, unfortunately, for the worship of their false idols and gods. It's not strange to see Israel here use a trumpet at all. And God uses these trumpets to summon the children of Israel together. So God asked Moses, I want you to make two trumpets from hammered silver. He is to use them to gather the community together, as well as for signaling the various camps to set up. And when both trumpets are sound, the entire community is to come together at the tent of meeting there, where God dwells, and then he will begin to lead them. When one trumpet is sounded, the tribe's leaders are to gather before Moses. The order of the trumpet blast will signal which tribes are to set out first because you have 12 tribes that are ready to go. And each tribe has a specific sound that is made that brings them towards the Lord. So tonight we're going to look at three points. Two trumpets, the order that God has established, and then third, rise up, O Lord, return, O Lord. And I'll explain that as we get into it. So the two trumpets here in verses 1 and 2. It says, verse 1, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Make two silver trumpets for yourself. You shall make them of hammered work. Now this was hammered work of silver, one complete trumpet made out of hammered work. These men were gifted. God had given them the gift to take the silver and to hammer it together and to create this instrument. The gift came from God. The same gifts that were given to the children of Israel to make the tabernacle. Those that were seamstress, those that would work with wood, those that would work with metals and so forth. It's God giving the gifts to create these trumpets. And you shall use them for calling the congregation and for directing the movement of the camp. The silver trumpets. Now, as, obvious, it, it, as is, is obvious from the material they are made of, these are not the ram's horns that you're, you might be thinking that they use from the, the ram's horns, and then they howl them out and create a trumpet from that. No, these are referring to handmade trumpets out of silver. This tubular flare trumpets were used in the period in military as well as ritual context. Uh, there is an example. In the tomb of King Tut was found a silver trumpet nearly two feet long. And so these trumpets were used by many civilizations. Uh, the silver work, the technique of silver mining were known as early as the mid-third millennium. They would extract silver from lead and refine it through several stages of purification. In Ur, which is the land where Abraham was taken out of, Ur is the uh, first known civilization to come up with writing, um, <clears throat> this is where we get the languages that begin to formate from the land of Ur. In Ur, silversmiths, artisans were producing musical instruments as well as jewelry and other items in the third millennium. 
So even as far as back then, there were men that were gifted in this area. And the trumpets are to be an enduring ordinance for Moses and all the generations after him. Look at verse 3. And they blew them, and when they blow both of them, all the congregation shall gather before you at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. One commentator said that if we follow Jewish tradition, long glass were used to assemble the people of Moses. So you can only imagine a long glass just with a sound going out as long as they can blow through that trumpet and it would summon the people to come together. Verse 4 says, but if they blow only one, then the leaders, the heads of the divisions of Israel, shall gather to you when you sound the advance, the camps that lie on the east side shall then begin their journey. And when you sound the advance the second time, then the camps that lie on the south side shall begin their journey. They shall sound the call for them to begin their journey. Their journey where? To the land of Canaan. Now you remember where the people of the land of Canaan came from, right? From the son of Noah, who was Canaan. Those were the people that dwelt in that place. And you remember the curse that came upon those people because of what Canaan did to Noah? They would be servants to the children of Israel. And so God was going to fulfill that promise uh, that uh, he gave as a curse to uh, Canaan there. You remember what happened, right? That uh, Canaan came into the room of Noah while he was drunk. And he saw his nakedness. Well, the word saw there means to glare upon, to handle, to do more than just looking. So the implication is, is that he had a sexual relationship with him. So then Noah comes out afterwards and he says, I know what you did. Now, how do you know what someone does if they did not touch you? You don't. You can be asleep and someone come into the room and you'll never know that that person came into the room. So how did Noah know? Because he knew what had happened. He he felt the touch of his son. And because of that curse, which is homosexuality, by the way, in case you didn't get it, because of that, God cursed them. And so now God is going to fulfill that curse by sending Israel in there and take over the land and they will become servants to them. Verse 7 says, and when, they, and when the assembly is to be gathered together, you shall blow, but not sound the advance. The son of Aaron, the priest, shall blow the trumpets, and these shall be to you as an ordinance forever throughout your generation. Boy, Aaron has a lot to do, doesn't he? <laughs> as the high priest, he's got to go into the Holy of Holies and offer atonements and sacrifices He's got to keep everybody in order. He's got to inspect. He's got, he's got a lot to do. Now he's got to blow the trumpets when the advancement is ready. <clears throat> I couldn't blow a trumpet, by the way. My cousin, who came from um, Texas, Austin, he was in a band, and he was in charge of the trumpet. And he came to visit us one time, and boy, he could play that trumpet. It was just so beautiful to hear him play that trumpet. And I get it, you know, put it on my mouth, and he tried to show me, and I came up with a little, you know, which, which was nothing, which was nothing. You have to have a set of lungs to blow in a trumpet like that. So you can imagine Aaron, <clears throat> and by the way, I mean, it makes sense for Aaron to do it because he had a lot of hot wind back then when he mailed this calf, you know? <laughs> you know, so he could blow through that trumpet and sound the advancement if that's what the Lord wanted him to do. And he would do that from generation. Verse 9 says, And when you go to war in your land against the enemy who oppresses you, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets, and you will be remembered before the Lord your God. Now that's important. Underline that. Because it's the Lord Lord God that is going to fight the battle with them. It's the Lord God that they're calling on. They're not calling on their own strength, by the way. They're not doing this in their own power. That's so important for us to understand that God goes with us. Do you understand that? That God is with you? No matter what you're going through right now, God is with you. He promised that. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That means that He is with you 
through the good, but also through the bad. And that's something that we need to remember when we are going through trials, when we're going through difficulties, when our finances you know, are diminishing, that God's right there. He's there. He hasn't left. And He has a plan and He has a purpose. Just like He was there when the disciples were in that boat and that storm was roaring, you know, and there's Jesus sleeping in the bow of the boat. He's there with them. Was He concerned for the storm? He was asleep while the storm was going on. He didn't have a care. He, he, knew, he knew what He could do. He knew what His Father could do. Disciples didn't. They should have realized, well, Jesus is in the boat. What do we have to worry about? You know, let's just ride this one out. Jesus will get us where we need to go because he's there. And, of course, they woke up. What, Master, don't you care? We're all going to perish. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, boy. And calm the storm. God is wherever you are. Remember that. He is there with you. And he has a purpose for you. Because he's given you a promise. He's given you a promise. Just like he's promised them. Here. You're going to the promised land. That's why I pulled you out of Egypt. That's why I did everything I did. I was with you while Pharaoh was chasing you. I divided the sea for you. I brought you to this place. Even though you denied me and made a calf, I still kept my promise. And I gave you ten commandments so that you know that these are my commandments for you. And I promised to get you over there. So why would I promise to get you over there and let you perish here? No, God doesn't do that. God has given us promises. Amen. Now the ultimate promise is what? Eternal life. <laughs> He's going to get us there no matter what. And it's His work and not ours. John 3.16 is true, right? For God so loved the world yes. that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever continually, that's in the Greek, believes in Him shall never perish. And so God promised he'll get you there. You'll get to eternal life. So there's no doubt about it. Even if man kills us, absent from the body is present with the Lord. So he's with us always. You need to remember that. Sound the trumpet. Why? Because the Lord's going to come. The Lord's going to come. And he's going to do that work. And you will be saved from your enemies, he said. Verse 10. Also in the day of your gladness, in your appointed feast. And at the beginning of your months, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, and they shall be a memorial for you before the Lord God, before your God. I am the Lord your God. Now, why blow trumpets? It's a memorial. It's a time to remember. It's a time to contemplate. It's a time to realize God has always been with us. Now, unfortunately... <clears throat> as they blow these two trumpets and they set off to the land of Canaan and they get there they forget <laughs> they forget oh no we can't go in there these are giants we saw them they're huge we're not going to be able to battle them and so their lack of faith and their lack of remembrance caused them to wander in the land for another 40 years until a new generation rose up. And then Joshua and Caleb led them into the promised land. See, we have to remember what the Lord does, especially in the midst of the fire, right? What is the Lord capable of doing? Boy, He's capable of doing anything. Do we believe that? I hope you believe that. That is our heritage as yes. Christians. He created the heavens and the earth. He created man out of the dust and then He blew His spirit into him. That's pretty powerful. I don't know of anybody that can manufacture something and then blow life into them. Only God can do that. Amen. And God holds everything. Everything consists in God himself. So he's very powerful. He's more than able to do that. And they should have realized that. We need to realize it when we're going through the fiery pits that Jesus walked in with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And Nebuchadnezzar said, hey, wait a minute. I, I thought we threw three in there. Where's, where'd the other one come from? That's the Son of God. That's the Son of God. That's Jesus in the fiery pit with us. That's important to know. And he gets right down there with you in the, in the midst of the battle. He's yes. fighting for you. 
I think that at that po- moment in time when we're battling and we're struggling, we have to cry out to God. God, I know you're here and I believe you're here and you have a promise and you're going to get me through this. Now, try not to just get through it, but try to learn what God is showing you because he's trying to show you something through it, that he is there with you. So that the next time you realize he was there then, he's going to be here now. So learn those lessons of his presence, of his promises that he has for us. So sound the trumpets, going to get ready to go, and I will be there with you because I am the Lord your God. Now number two, the orders. Now at this point, the Israelites are still in Sinai, having left Egypt only, what, 13 months earlier. So it's been just a month over a year since they left Egypt, which really should be fresh in their mind, you would think. Uh, I can remember last year a few things and what the Lord has done. We should be able to remember the things that the Lord has done. They obviously should have remembered what the Lord had done, especially since they still had the cloud over them uh, by day and night, the fire leading them because they didn't move until the cloud moved. And when that cloud moved, then they moved. They had to wait for that cloud. In our calendar, it was probably right around May. So, very cloudy, rainy. Israel is just kind of like California. When you go there, it reminds me of California. You have your mountain ranges with snow and it's cold, but then you have your desert areas like we do in our, in our area. And then you have your beautiful beaches and so forth. Very, very beautiful. So, the month of May, it's probably when they were setting out. And God tells Moses when the Israelites are to leave Sinai, the cloud was to move from above their tabernacle so the Israelites could set out from the desert. Look at verse 11. Now it came to pass on the the 12th day of the second month in the second year that the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle of testimony. And the children of Israel set out from the wilderness of Sinai on their journey. And then the cloud settled down in the wilderness of Paran. So imagine this cloud all of a sudden moving. And the children of Israel, everyone, all the tribes had their specific tasks that they needed to do, tearing everything down, preparing it to be uh, movable, and they followed the cloud until it stopped and they put everything down and set everything back up again. This was God's way of leading the children of Israel. So they started out for the first time according to the command of the Lord by the hand of Moses. How does the Lord lead us today? Because obviously we don't have a cloud. We don't have a cloud. We don't have fire. What do we have? We have his word. We have his word. And I believe that the Lord leads us by natural means. When you... Well, let me put it this way, and I think you'll understand it, because um, we kind of put a certain responsibility on celebrities, right? When you become a celebrity, and I'm not talking Hollywood celebrity, I'm talking a sports person, there's a certain responsibility that you have. You're a football player, basketball player, there's a certain way you should act. Now, obviously, they don't all do that, but the ones that take it serious, let's, let's, let's just look at Tebow, you know? He has a responsibility as a football player. He really believes I have a responsibility to reveal God's character to those that watch me. He feels that. And so that's how he's led. That whatever he does, he's going to reflect God in his life. And people are going to see that. And so I really believe that's how the Lord leads us today. By his word, by learning his character and applying the scriptures to our life. And as we walk daily with the Lord, he leads us, knowing that we have a responsibility like Tebow, because he represents not just the NFL, but also God, that he's going to act appropriately as he's walking in the world. And God will lead us that way. Isn't it interesting that sometimes God just leads you to somebody? You could be in the store, you could be driving, you know, whatever. Whatever. And all of a sudden you meet somebody and you start talking and you're like, wow, it's like God just kind of set this up because now he's either encouraging you or you're encouraging them and you both walk away like, I'm just so glad we met, you know, 
I'm just so glad we met. And I think that's a leading and a divine appointment by God. And so the Lord leads us by natural means, but he leads us with his spirit within us, and he leads us with a responsibility to reflect him. Just like the children of Israel, they're going to reflect him as they're being led. They're going to reflect how they trust him because they're going to follow the cloud and they're going to stop as the cloud stops. And when God gets into the land of Canaan, they're going to trust him and they're going to also put their faith in him that he is going to deliver the enemy into their hands. So it says a lot about their character towards God. So they started out for the first time according to the Lord Han and Moses. And then 14 comes along and says, the standard of the camp of the children of, it, of Judah set out first according to their armies over the armies of Nashon, the son of Abimadad, over the armies of the tribe of the children of Issachar. Now these are the 12 tribes that are set up right around the tabernacle. And now they're all going to set out into battle. Issachar was Nathaniel, the son of Zar. And over the armies of the tribe of the children of Zebulon was Elap, the son of Helon. Then the, tri the tabernacle was taken down, and the sons of Gershon and the sons of uh, Merai set out, carrying the tabernacle. And the standard of the camp of Reuben set out according to their armies. <clears throat> over their armies was El Azur, the son of she dear over the armies of the tribe of the children of Simon was Shilimur, the son of Zer Ish Haddai, and over the armies of the tribe of the children of Gad was Eli Shaph, the son of Deo. Then the Kohatites set out carrying the holy things. The tabernacle would be prepared for their arrival. And the standard of the camp of the children of Ephraim set out according to their armies. Over their armies was Elishema, the son of Amimahad. Over the armies of the tribe of the children of Manasseh was Gamriel, the son of Perazu. And over the armies of the tribe of the children of Benjamin was Abindan, the son of Gideon. Then the standard of the camp of the children of Dan, the rear guard, of all the camps set out according to their armies. Over their armies was Ahizar, the son of Amimashadai. Over the army of the tribe of the children of Asher was Pigel, the son of Akran. And over the armies of the tribe of the children of Nephilim was Ahera, the son of Ena. Thus was the order of march of the children of Israel according to their armies when they began their journey. So God tells Moses when to leave Sinai. And the cloud was removed from above their tabernacle, and so the Israelites could head out into the desert. Now notice the order. You have to notice the order here. God is a God of order again, right? And everyone is in their place. Everyone is doing their thing. And that is so important for us to understand that that is what God wants us to do. Be careful that you don't go outside of that order. I have just seen it from time to time when you go outside of that order. Young men who come into ministry and they have a heart for the Lord. They have a heart for ministry. They have a heart for people, but they're pushing too quickly. They're not taking their time. They're not investing correctly and they want to push and they end up causing disruptions or divisions because there's an order that things happen. We have to realize that. You don't just get put into ministry like that. It takes time for the Lord to minister to everyone, to see how things will work, whether a person can get along with other people. And so there's a time of watching and waiting uh, before we just put someone in order. And that's what they did in the early church, right? Okay, we need someone to wait on tables, so let's watch. Let's watch. Let's see who waits on tables normally when they come in, or do they just sit around and do nothing? Well, that guy just sits around and do nothing. Should we put him in as a deacon and raise him up? No, I wouldn't think so. You want to get somebody that's heart is already doing it. You don't have to ask. They're already looking for opportunities. You know, when someone has a heart of service, they're always looking to find a way to serve. That's, you know how you determine you have a heart for service? You're serving. 
You come in and you see a piece of paper, you pick it up, you throw it away. You know, you see things missing, you just go and get it and you put them in order. You know how the church functions, you know, and all churches are different. They have different ministries and so forth. But our church, you know, some, they get here early. They set up and everyone has their part. The tables get pulled out, the chairs get put in. It's not chaotic. They're all doing it, putting it all together. And the same thing is true. It's almost like in reverse. And everything gets put back in, you know, all in order, not chaotic. And people know their parts and so forth. A servant will go in and say, oh, look, they're moving that, so let's, let me go help them. Now, maybe you don't have that gift, and you're saying, yeah, I, you know, I just, I don't see that stuff. I don't know why I don't see that stuff, you know. I, I could be standing there watching guys move and stuff, and I don't even think I should be helping them. Why is that? Well, maybe you have a different gift. Maybe you don't have the gift of service. You have to find the gift that you have. Uh, maybe your gift is, is, you know, who knows what, what it could be. It could, it could be, you know, a gift of uh, encouragement. And you don't necessarily serve, but you encourage people. And you find people that aren't feeling well or need prayer, and you go over, hey, can I encourage you? you know, can I pray for you? And, and you just are always praying. That person would be great as a prayer warrior. You know, someone to call on to pray for people. Someone to maybe greet people as they're leaving or as they're coming in, get to know them. You know, some people are very friendly. Uh, look at the gifts and then use those gifts. The children of Israel had gifts and their gifts were being used accordingly. Uh, the ones that had the gifts for the curtains, they didn't go over there and say, let me get all the rods down. You know, no, they took care of the curtains. They did what they needed to do to get the job done. Verse 29. Now Moses said to Hobah, Hoba, the son of Reel, the Medanite, Moses' father-in-law, we are setting out for the place of which the Lord said, and I will give it to you. Come with us, and we will treat you well. For the Lord has promised good things to Israel. Now here's that promise again. The Lord has promised good things to Israel. What did the Lord promise? Well, God promised Abraham that his seed would be great. And so far, he's kept that promise, right? Because yeah. we still have Israel as a nation. 1948 to 52, they became a nation. In all of our history, no one has ever been a nation, then been destroyed and scattered and come back and become a nation. That's impossible, and yet God made it possible because he had a promise for them. God kept his promise to Israel. He said that he would scatter them, but then he'd bring them back, and they're coming back to Israel. God has a promise for us, right? So as we're going through our trials, fiery trials and so forth, God has a promise. You remember the, the, the Hebrew boys, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And as they were ready to go into the fire, um, they didn't fear, fear right? Because they believed in God's promises. And there were two that they had, right? Either God will deliver us. That's one promise. God will deliver us. He's a faithful God. He can deliver us. He's got the power. He's done it in the past. He, so either he's going to deliver us as he promised, or we go home to him. He takes us home. Two promises. Those promises are true for us today. So either God's going to deliver us out of this, or he's going to take us home. We're going to believe that. I don't know if you knew this or not, but I believe there was a Christian... Uh, group that was raided out here in San Diego recently. Government just went in and raided them. And they thought it was another Koresh kind of cultic thing and they went in there correct. And Brad Dacus is now representing them because they went in there falsely. <clears throat> Again, trying to control what we say and what we do. Uh, that's what the world is trying to do. See, God has promised us certain things. And if we preach the gospel, he promises that he'll deliver us or he'll take us home. You know? Now, as Christians, we have all kinds of promises that God has given to us and personal promises that he's given to us. And we have to believe those promises. You know, God is not a liar like man. He keeps his promises. You know, he doesn't have to swear. And if he swears, he swears there's no one even higher above him. You know, <laughs> he can't even <laughs> swear. He doesn't need to swear. <laughs> He's not a liar. And when he says something, he's going to do it because he promised. So we have to know that God has a future and a hope for us. And he told that to Israel in Jeremiah, right? 
He didn't tell that to us, but he told that to Israel. I have a future and a hope for you. Now we take that promise and we make it our own in the New Testament. But God has told us that, that he has a future and a hope for us too. The church. We are the church. And what he said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so no matter what they do, the church is going to go on. That's what he's promised. We have to be a part of the church. I hope you're a part of the church. And you've given in your life to Jesus Christ and surrendered yourself to him to be in that promise that God has. So as you're going through life struggles and as God is leading you, remember the promises and remind him of those, Lord, you promised. And remind me, Lord, that you promised. And so you're going to get me through this. You're going to get me through this. You're going to lead me. You're going to guide me just as you promised. Verse 30. And he said to him, I will not go, but I will depart. Now this is... Uh, uh, Real, who was the father-in-law of Moses, he said, no, I don't want to go with you. I'm going to depart to my own land and to my own relatives. And so Moses said, please do not leave in as much as you know how we are to camp in the wilderness and you can be our eyes. And it shall be, if you go with us, indeed it shall be that whatever good the Lord will do to us, the same we will do to you. Now you can take this two ways. <clears throat> Moses either had faith in God or Moses didn't have faith in God. You can take it this way and say, Moses is trusting his father-in-law to lead them to certain places. But wait a minute. Isn't it God leading them by the cloud to certain places? And so Moses is not trusting in God and not having faith in God. You can look at it that way. And he's trusting in his father-in-law. He's done this before. His father-in-law came in and gave him some advice. And Moses took that advice. You know, Moses, you're just too busy. You've got too much on your hands. You need to find some faithful men. You need to let them go out there to the masses and you handle the big cases. McGee says that that was a lack of faith in Moses' part. God would have given him the strength to do it. And then I hear others that, that say no. He was using the gifts that God had given to men to help within the work that he was doing. So you can look at it one way or the other. It really doesn't matter. I think both are true to a certain degree, but sometimes we can trust in men to lead us. You know, Calvary Chapel, as we know, was founded by Pastor Chuck Smith, and he was a great leader to all those in Calvary Chapel. They loved him. They saw his leadership. They saw the gifts that God had given him, the things that God did through him, and God did some great works. Personally, I loved Chuck, and I loved the simplicity that he had, and the faith he, that he had in God completely, and that he never took glory from God. He knew it was all God's work, and if you were to ask him how he did it, he'd say, I did not do a thing. It was all God's work. His humility was amazing. His servanthood was off the hook. I, I never met a pastor that served like Chuck. Still haven't met one that served like Chuck. And you know the story. Romaine was looking for him one day because service was about ready to start. And they couldn't find him. And finally they found him in the bathroom. He was fixing the toilet that was overflowing. That's a servant's heart right before the message. That's the heart that I want. That's the heart that I strive for. And so here's a great man. And men began to follow him and start Calvary chapels. He started the radio Bible, uh, the radio show, K-Wave, and he said, you know, you don't need to go to seminary school. I'm going to have seminary school here on the radio. And common guys can listen to all these teachings and get this great information, and, and they can be in seminary school from the radio. And he was so right. Mm -hmm. That's where I learned most of my stuff, was listening to K-Wave and other radio stations like Walter Martin and, you know, uh, K-Bright, and of course, KKLA and some of these great men, Dr. Dobson, awesome for family. I learned so much from him just to raise my own family. A lot of the things that I implemented were from Dobson's show that he taught on. And Chuck was right on. He didn't care about the seminary schools that you went to. And he had all these little sayings, right, where the Lord guides, he provides, Amen. right? Blessed are the flexible, for they will not break, you know, and all of these things. And now he's gone, and there's no leader. 
there's no leader to lead us and we're looking for a leader. <clears throat> but I think that Chuck was brilliant in that he made sure that we were not a denomination and that our leader would be his leader. And that was God. But let's just let Jesus lead us. Let's let him. What Chuck taught us about Jesus and how Jesus leads us, let us let him lead us. And I think that we need to learn that, that Jesus is our leader. And you can have an organization like Calvary Chapel and not have a leader there as far as a man, but yet let God be your leader. Because we all have the fellowship of one another. And the one thing that, this, that makes us distinct from everyone else is our love for one another and our acceptance for one another from different nationalities, backgrounds, ethnicity, all of these things. We all know that we want to do one thing, and that is feed the sheep. That they're well fed through the Word of God. From book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, from beginning to end, and then start over again. The simple Word of God. And that's what we all want to do. And that's what keeps us together. And reminds us of that. And we can be separated, but yet we're still together. I really believe that. So, yet God raises up leaders that you have to follow and be led by, but yet you have the leader that's really leading you. And that is the head of the body of Christ, which is Christ himself. Right? Amen? Amen. <clears throat> so, he's trying to get him to go with him. And so he's... <laughs> He's a father-in-law, right? I mean, there's always friction between father-in-laws. And so Moses said, come on, father-in-law. Look, if you go with us, God's going to bless us. We'll bless you. You'll get something out of this. You know, it's going to work out for all of us and, and so forth. And so he decides, okay, I'll go with you. Sounds good to me. And he doesn't go home. So he, he convinces them to go with him. We can hear, read the story in Exodus chapter 2 about his father-in-law and how he gave him that wisdom. Uh, there too, so interesting story. Third point, and then we'll close here. Uh, rise up, O Lord, return, O Lord. Important point here, look at verses 33. So they departed from the mountain of the Lord on a journey of three days, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them for the three-day journey to search out a resting place for them. And the cloud of the Lord was above them by day when they went out from the camp. So as they began their journey to the promised land, they were guided by God's presence and not by themselves. Important. They weren't led by their own desires, their own ways. There's a way that seems right to a man, but that way leads unto death. No, we need to let the Lord guide us and lead us, not our own. Be careful of that. You want blessings? Let the Lord lead you. Amen. If you want struggles, try leaving yourself. Because yes. there's a way that you think is right, but it's not the way of the Lord. That way will lead you to destruction. There will be potholes and struggles along your way. Mm -hmm. I don't know, you've ever tried doing your own way, and then you do it and you realize, why am I struggling with this? It ain't working out. Lord, I give up. Take over. You do the work. So they followed the cloud no matter where God led them. Now this is blind faith, right? We don't know. Where are you going? I don't know. Who are you following? That cloud. Where is it going? We don't know. We're just going to go. And sometimes ministry is like that. I get, I get that from people. On, Pastor, what, when, when are we going to do this? I, I don't know. Well, do you have any idea? I'm praying about it. Can you let me know when? When I know. <laughs> and you know, people get so frustrated with me with that. I just, you know, because I, I don't know. Sometimes it's the last moment. I get, let's, let's go do this, guys. Let's do this. I think there was one pastor that was sharing about uh, um, their goals and their visions for next year and how they set things up. <clears throat> I have a list <clears throat> that I write out all the things we do throughout the years and I try to stick with that list that when they come up again, do we do this or not do it as it comes. But one pastor was sharing and saying, I don't plan for anything. I don't make plans at all. Uh, John Corson was asked, what's your goal? He goes, I, I have no goals. I just wait for the Lord to lead me. And so wherever he leads me, that's my goal, is to be faithful. I know that I'm going to teach the Word of God. I know we're going to go through the Bible. That's a constant. That's not changing. That's my goal. Um, praying up until that event takes place. You know, and seeing what the Lord does. It took us 
at least four meetings before we finally finalized everything. You know, we were looking at one cabin and it looked great, but didn't get it. And then looked at another cabin and I was too late, couldn't get it. And now all of a sudden I got this one cabin and got it. And Carlos saying, that's not the one we were looking at though. I don't know. It's the one we got. <laughs> it's the one the Lord wants us to have. So there it is. How did you find it? I don't know. <laughs> I thought it was the one you text me, you know, but it didn't look like it. I remember seeing that pool table there. I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> but isn't it interesting that, that when you walk like that by faith, and then something great happens, and you go, I could not have done that. Amen. I could not have set Amen. that up at all. You. you know, I think of our Calvary care. I was telling somebody <clears throat> this, and... Um, <clears throat> how our church has grown because of the Calvary Care and meeting the needs of all these these people who have no resources at all. They they don't um, they don't really give to the church. Not that they don't want to give, I'm sure, and some do, but they don't really have the resources. And I remember someone saying to me, you know, there was a church that that felt like they wanted to do something like that, so they presented to the to the leadership, and the leadership said, no, 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 we don't want to do that because there's no resources that come in. So what we need to do is focus on Orange County and getting people that have resources in first. And then once we get all the resources in and able to support us and staff and all of that, then we'll think about reaching the homeless. See, that's their, their way of thinking. There's a way that seems right to a man. Now, I didn't even know that it was going to do what, what this thing did, you know, until Dave Hawking came here and he looked out there and he's like, wow. What a great work of God. And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? What you're doing there? You know, like, yeah, we've been doing this for years. You know, with, with, but you're reaching these people. And then all of a sudden they start getting saved. Now they're getting baptized. And it's like, I could not have planned that. Amen. I could not have planned that. Amen. That's all God. There's no resources, but that's God. And he's taking care of it. He's taking care of it completely. So <clears throat> they departed. The Lord would take care of them. Rise up, O Lord. Verse 33. So they departed from the mountain of the Lord on a journey three days. I read that. Yeah. And they went in the, out in the camp. In verse 35. So it was, whenever the ark set out, that Moses said, Rise up, O Lord. Let your enemies be scattered. And let those who hate you flee before you. Now, a couple of things about that. First, Moses gave it all to God. Lord, you rise up. And you let your enemies scatter. He didn't say that my enemies. He said your enemies. Now the enemies were against the children of Israel. They would be battling their enemies. But Moses said, no God, they're your enemies. You scatter them. It's important for us to remember. Lord, these are your enemies. You take care of them. I'm just going to trust in you. I'm going to put my faith in you and know that you're going to rise up and you're going to take care of everything. David did that. The whole Psalms are written about how the Lord took care of his enemies. Uh, he'd get upset in the beginning. All oh, these men, you know, if I could break them, kind of go, yeah. He'd say all these things, and, and it's funny how the Psalms does this. It, it starts with this powerful guy getting angry and bitter, and, and all of a sudden it ends with, but Lord, you're God. You know, and you'll rise up, and you'll take care of this, because you realize you can't do a thing. It's got to be God that does it. Let those who hate you flee before you, Lord. And when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, to the many thousands of Israel. That is so important, to invite the Lord to be a part of your life and continue to be a part of your life. Now let me close with this quickly. And I like to close with this because I like to close with the fact that everything speaks about Jesus. So what does this say about Jesus? Well, there's going to be a trumpet sound. The Bible says in Thessalonians that there's a trumpet that will be sound. And when the trumpet is sound, the rapture will take place. And Jesus will come for his church and rapture the church out of this world. In a twinkling of an eye, we will be in heaven. And our bodies will go with it glorified. And the dead in Christ's bodies will rise up with those who already proceeded into heaven heaven and it will be a glorious time when that trumpet sounds i believe that we will all see it and we will be gone when we hear it Amen. in a twinkling of an eye now we can find that in thessalonians chapter um 
4, verse 16 through 18, where it uses the word rapture, but we know that it does not occur in our Bible anywhere. The term comes from the Latin word meaning to carry off or to be transported or snatch away. And I love using this analogy because it just makes so much sense. And if you throw a bunch of garbage into a can, whatever that can is, take one of these magnets that they have at a dump site where they lift up cars, bring it over to that garbage junk, turn it on, what is going to be lifted out? All the metal and everything else will be left. All those who are in Christ Jesus, who have surrendered to Him, will all be raptured up when He comes. He'll just pull out those that are His, just like that metal and that magnet mm. comes. Yeah. It's going to be a beautiful snatching away. A second, or 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 4, talks about that also, how the glorified bodies will be given to us as believers in Jesus Christ. It says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, he who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so Will we be with the Lord forever? Isn't that a picture of the cloud leading Israel? Yeah. And the Lord being with them forever as he promised them? See, we have nothing to worry about. Nothing to worry about at all. God's with you. I know it's hard and it's difficult to go through things, but we need to remember God's with you. He's right there by your side. And he'll get you through. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your precious word. What a beautiful picture that we see there, Lord, and with the children of Israel. Lord. The cloud, oh, we can't wait, Lord. When it gets cloudy, sometimes I look up and I say, is it now, Lord? Or am I going to hear that trumpet sound? And I just hope, Lord, that that last person has given their life to you, Lord, and we would hear that trumpet. Amen. That would be so awesome, Lord. Now, I don't know if we'll experience that or the next generation. Only you know that, Lord. But Lord, what an awesome promise you've given to us, Father. Whether we're raptured or whether absent from the body, we're present with you, Lord. Yes. Thank you, Father. And I pray for those that are here tonight and those that are listening, Lord, that you would be with them, Lord. And they would recognize the fact that you will never leave them or forsake them, Lord. That you're right there by their side. And that you love them and care for them more so than anything else, Lord. And you've made promises, and you're going to fulfill those promises because he who begun a good work in you is faithful to complete it. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. Have a wonderful night, a rest, and we will see you hopefully on Sunday. If you have some time, I don't know if you noticed, but we're working in the foyer area. Uh, we're going to be uh, putting some baseboard, painting, and doing some removing of knobs and the new knobs and switches. So if you've got anything going on uh, Saturday, nothing going on Saturday morning, you want to come out and help us. I'm going to plant some plants out in the front, get those set up so we kind of looks uh, beautiful out there. We got work to do, so if you're not doing anything, God bless you guys. Have a wonderful night. Lord, Lord.